Well, hello everyone, it is 10 o'clock. Um, my name is Andrea Bodazatu. I am Assistant Professor and Enology Extension Specialist with Texas A&M, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. And this webinar is part of the Enology webinar series that we organize here at Texas A&M. Our presenter today is Mr. Drew Horton. He is the Enology Specialist of, at the University of Minnesota with a grape and breeding, grape breeding and enology project. Um, he previously was at Iowa State University with a Midwest Grape and Wine Industry Institute. And uh, Mr. Horton has also worked as commercial winemaker in um, California as well as in Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Horton will be talking to us today about practical barrel management and maintenance. And before I um, hand it over to him, I would just like to ask you to um, hold your questions until the end of the presentation. The presentation is going to be around uh, 45 to 50 minutes long. We'll have some time at the end for um, Q&A. Um, and I would also like to ask you to please, please, please uh, fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. It only takes, um, I don't know, half a minute, maybe a minute, and it helps me keep this um, event going. So, Mr. Horton, thank you very much for agreeing to be here with us today. Thank you for um, um, preparing this presentation, and I will switch it over to you now. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bodazatu. Um, when I was asked uh, about giving this presentation, I was uh, delighted to be able to help. Uh, I'm a huge fan of barrels. Um, I've spent uh, about 20 years in commercial winemaking uh, before getting into uh, academia. Um, I think my biggest claim to fame in terms of my barrel knowledge is I work for a Gallo winery uh, in Santa Barbara, California, a Bridalwood winery uh, for a little over three years. And we had a 4,000 barrel cellar. Yeah. And uh, on top of all the other work and, and knowledge I already had about barrels, I really learned a lot uh, working in a large uh, barrel cellar like that. And so uh, the first word of my presentation is practical. I hope to answer, uh, to address practical issues um, if anybody wants to know about the science of wood and the science of microoxidation, uh, I suggest they speak to somebody else. Uh, I'm here to give good, uh, close to the ground, practical knowledge. And uh, let's just go ahead and get started. So the first question, uh, or sort of as by way of introduction to the subject, I have a few slides here about why we use barrels. Uh, of course, the obvious answer is they add aroma and flavor. And they allow this slow and steady microoxidation, which is a very complex uh, chemical reaction that happens over time that uh, makes wine taste better, feel better, takes the edges off of it, adds complexity. Uh, barrels, of course, also invoke tradition and high quality. So barrels have a marketing value as well. Barrels have been around uh, for about 3,000 years. And... Uh, uh, so it really, when you say tradition, there, there really is a long-term tradition to barrel use. And of course, uh, if you look at the top 100 wines in Wine Spectator, uh, far and away, uh, the vast majority of those wines spent some time in barrel. So if you want to make top flight wines uh, uh, that are of highest quality, uh, you're certainly going to consider some, uh, some barrel use uh, along the way. Um, there's no question, barrel-aged wines have more overall complexity, they have increased structure, enhanced flavors and aromas, and often a much better aging potential. Um, and get to the bottom line, when your customers come into the tasting room and they see uh, some beautiful barrels uh, behind the counter or, or uh, through the window into the cellar, uh, uh, that adds uh, to your bank account. They are always going to be willing to pay a bit more for your wines uh, when they see barrels uh, because of their perception of quality. And let's face it, uh, barrels are sexy. Uh, they look great. Uh, they're interesting creatures and uh, uh, people want to hear about them and know about them. Here's just a quick list of basic pros and cons uh, of barrels. Uh, some of this I've already addressed. 
Uh, here in the upper Midwest, we've got high acidity grapes. So along with all the other advantages uh, that barrels can do for wine, uh, though they do not quantitatively, quantitatively reduce total acidity, uh, they certainly have effects on texture uh, that can reduce uh, perceived tartness or high acidity. Uh, so there's another reason uh, for barrel use is they can help sort of counteract high acidity wines or, or take the edges off of, of rather tart wines. Barrels can be expensive. Uh, wine does evaporate. Uh, I've heard uh, up to 6 or 7% of the volume uh, can be lost per year. Uh, that is ex extensive. Um, uh, they do take up space. You need some special tools. They take extra effort. Uh, occasionally need to be replaced. Uh, and you're carrying inventory. Uh, every time you're leaving wine in a barrel longer than a year, you're carrying that inventory into the next year. So uh, there are winemaking concerns and there are bottom line business concerns as well. Uh, before we get into it, uh, here's a basic outline of the parts, uh, the anatomy of a barrel. I think the most important thing I want to draw your attention to is the lower right, uh, the crows, C-R-O-Z-E. The crows is the joint between the wood that makes up the heads of the barrel and the staves of the barrel. And you may all not be woodworkers or carpenters, but I think intuitively you can appreciate uh, that that joint there uh, where the staves meet the head, that is the... Now, that is the, the point of uh, most likely in jeopardy, uh, most likely in need of occasional repair or attention. Um, but it's good to know the terminology uh, of all of these other uh, parts of the barrel. Uh, of course, the uh, each barrel has two heads, uh, and every barrel has a bung hole and a bung, uh, hopefully. Um, and I, hope, I just remembered it, looking at this uh, I did not uh, make any mention in my presentation about bungs in particular. If somebody would remind me to make a little statement at the end about bungs, uh, types of bungs, uses of bungs, which, what are good bungs and what are bad bungs, I'll, I'll give that 30 seconds or so. Um, but there you go. There's a uh, little overview of the anatomy. And again, we'll talk about the crows uh, a little later on. So you've uh, bought yourself a brand new barrel or maybe you've bought some high quality used barrels. Uh, before you put wine in them, uh, you need to soak them up. Uh, wood, of course, uh, is part water, and as the wood dries out, it uh, contracts. Uh, I've seen some old barrels that have not been well maintained, and you can see daylight uh, right through the staves. Uh, and even a barrel that old and dried out can be made uh, watertight again uh, by moisture. You get water into a barrel, everything wants to expand, all those joints between the staves and there at the crows uh, swell up uh, and seal. So uh, there's more than one way to prepare a barrel uh, for use. Uh, I prefer the so-called French method and uh, it's very simple. Uh, you get, uh, you know, two, three, four gallons of hot water. Uh, doesn't have to be boiling hot, but of course the hotter it is, the more effective it is. Uh, pour that right into the bung hole uh, of the barrel and then stand the barrel up on its one head. So that amount of water is now soaking the inside of the bottom head on the floor. Uh, now go ahead and take a few gallons of hot water and pour it onto the outside of the what is now the upper head of the barrel. And uh, allow about 20 minutes to go by for that hot water to seep or soak into that crow's uh, joint, both on the top what's now the top head and the bottom head of that barrel. After about 20 minutes or a half hour, you can just turn that barrel over and the water on the inside will now be soaking the uh, inside of the head that was formerly on top uh, and throw uh, now another two or three, four gallons of uh, hot water on now what is the outside of the upper uh, head of the barrel. And again, after about 20 or 30 minutes, uh, the crows uh, should have soaked up and sealed well. Uh, I then would put the barrel on a rack with the bung hole down and rinse the inside of the barrel. Uh, I've got, I'll show you a picture of a few different spray balls and these, these arms. Uh, basically a three to five minute 
uh, rinse with hot or warm water uh, should finish uh, sealing up, uh, soaking up the barrel. Uh, will cause all of the joints uh, everywhere where wood meets wood, uh, you have a joint there, and all of those need to be moistened and soaked up and expanded. Uh, now, this is not a guarantee uh, that your barrel is absolutely 100% uh, leak-proof. Um, uh, depending on my experience with a certain cooperage, I know certain uh, cooperages uh, always send me really good tight barrels, and I can just do this basic French method, and I'll be comfortable putting wine right in it. If I bought used barrels, or perhaps uh, I suspect the barrels may be drier than what, uh, uh, what I would prefer, uh, I may decide to go ahead and just fill. After doing this French method, I may uh, put the barrel onto a rack with the bunghole up and just fill it up with cold water uh, all the way to the top uh, and watch that barrel for a few hours to see if there's any obvious leaks uh, or water loss. Uh, certainly, water will continue to soak into uh, the barrel, and you'll see that water level go down a little bit. Uh, but if you don't see any uh, actual dripping, you should be good to go. If you do see some dripping, just leave that cold water in the barrel overnight on a rack on your winery floor, uh, because it may take the time overnight for any of those leaks, again, to sort of swell up and seal themselves. However, if you do still have a barrel leaking after you've done all this, uh, the first call I would make would be to the barrel seller or manufacturer uh, to say, hey, I've got a leaky barrel and tell them what you've done to, to get it ready. And uh, hopefully they're going to offer you some option. Either they're going to come out and repair it or they'll have you send it back in or something. Um, the optimum barrel storage environment, once the barrel is full of wine, uh, I like to keep my barrel room at about 55, uh, certainly below 60 is best, not much below 50, somewhere in that range uh, uh, is encouraged. And if you have the ability to control the humidity, uh, not everybody does. Um, if you don't control the humidity and the humidity is drier than what I've listed here, your rate of evaporation is gonna be a little higher. Uh, but if you can create humidity there's various systems out there. The smart fog is a system I've used uh, to maintain a barrel room humidity. Uh, of course, this humidity is going to reduce evaporation loss. Uh, if you're too humid, uh, you'll lead to uh, green uh, mold issues on the barrel exterior, and that's no fun either. Uh, so humidity is another one of those things where some is good, too much not so good. Um, I don't like to see a barrel room tightly sealed up. I do like some um, measure of ventilation to keep some fresh air in there. Uh, it does not matter if your barrel room is dark or light or if it has lights or sunlight comes in. Uh, no light is going to get through uh, the barrel itself. So it doesn't have to be dark for any reason. Uh, but what really is important for any wine storage, whether wine is in a tank or a barrel or in a bottle, we're always trying to keep that temperature regime stable. Uh, we don't want it to go up to 70 degrees and then drop down to 50 at night. Uh, day after day of these fluctuations uh, can cause oxidation, can cause uh, uh, premature aging, uh, increased wine loss. Um, come on, scroll you. There we go. Now, barrel lifespan. I'm asked often about this. Uh, how long will a barrel last? And of course, uh, I'm sure some of you are giggling. Of course, a barrel salesman uh, will want you to believe that barrels don't last too long because they want you to buy a new set of barrels every three years. Uh, you know, there are some wineries uh, in Napa Valley that age their Cabernet in 200% new oak. Uh, how is that possible? Well, they put all their wine in 100% new oak barrels, and after six months, they take it out of those barrels and put it back into a new set of 100% new barrels. And to my way of thinking, that's unnecessary and completely over-oaking. Uh, but I guess some people appreciate that style and are willing to pay $100 a bottle for it. Uh, but anyway, I think the, the point I'm making is obvious. Of course, a barrel company or a barrel salesman wants you to buy barrels and buy them often. Uh, I know a lot of winemakers in California who are pulling back on the use of oak and are getting much more, uh, many more vintages out of their barrels. 
uh, and using a lot higher percentage of neutral or, or barrels that are older than three or four years that are no longer offering flavor or aroma, uh, but they're still very useful as a as a maturation festival uh, vessel. Speaking of maturation, I'll uh, make a quick little technical note here uh, because we winemakers throw these terms around and in the interest of precision and accuracy, uh, when wine is in a barrel or a tank, it is actually maturing. It doesn't start aging until it's in a bottle. Uh, so the term barrel aging is actually a, an oxymoron. It sh we should be using the term barrel maturation. Anyway, uh, as you can see by what's on the slide here, basically if you keep a wine in a brand new barrel for a year, you're going to take out about 50% of its flavor and aroma and down the line. Second year, about 30%. Third year, maybe 15%. These are approximate numbers. But basically what I'm trying to say is by the end of that fourth year of barrel use, you now have a neutral barrel uh, that's not really given much more flavor or aroma, uh, but it's still a very, very uh, excellent vessel uh, to mature your wine. And I know quite a few wineries uh, that use their barrels up to eight or 10 years uh, before disposing them. Uh, but you you can't just put a barrel away and forget about it. They do need to be maintained and we'll get more into those nuts and bolts uh, a little later. You know, in general, when we're talking about clean, clean and sanitize in any aspect of winemaking, there are so few things we can really control in a vineyard or in a winery or not many. Uh, but one of the things we really can control is clean and sanitized. And I encourage all of you uh, to practice clean and sanitized. They're different things. If you don't know the difference, look it up. Um, uh, a clean winery produces happy, clean wines. Uh, if the greatest compliment I get as a winemaker is, boy, your wines sure are clean. Uh, that's a fine, uh, fine thing. They don't have to be the most complex, the most concentrated, uh, the most poetic. If they're merely the cleanest wines around, I'll be happy. All right. Uh, Dr. Bodazatu had reminded me, uh, are there ways to recondition barrels? There are. I'm not a huge fan of any of them, but I'll just go through them. Uh, there is a company called Recoup Barrels out in California. You can send them uh, your older uh, barrels and they'll take the heads off and either shave or sand or sandblast uh, a few millimeters uh, off the inside of the staves. Uh, and then they'll retoast them to whatever level you like and reseal them, put the heads back on them and send them back to you. Uh, so far, all I somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is only available in California. So you're going to spend quite a bit of money shipping your barrels out there. And I noticed on a couple of recoup barrels that I've used, the only real aroma I got out of it was sort of this pencil shaving aroma. There wasn't much vanilla or spice or caramel or brown sugar. It was just sort of this kind of generic pencil shaving, I call it. Kind of a fakey, that's not a very good term. But anyway, uh, if you got to save money, you need to get more life out of the barrels. Certainly recoupering can be considered. Uh, I wouldn't want to use 100% recoup barrels on my wines. Uh, in the last five or 10 years, there's a company called CryoClean that's developed a new proprietary method of using little dry ice beads to blast away a few millimeters of the stave interior. Uh, and that does uh, open the wood up and cleans out all the old tartrates, unplugs uh, where the tartrates have plugged up the little gaps uh, in the wood grain. Uh, I have not used these. I don't know any winemakers who've used these, these cryo clean barrels, but preliminary uh, reviews that I've looked at uh, seem pretty positive. Um, but then again, it's as far as I know, only available in California. So you're going to have to ship your barrels out there. Uh, maybe if you've got a whole bunch of barrels over a hundred or 200, they might come out to Texas for you. Or if you've got a group of wineries might want to get together, but those are the two methods I know about reconditioning. And once a barrel wears out, what the heck can you do with it? Is there any way to get some of the money back out of it? Um, of course, the obvious, which I'm sure some of you have already done, is just saw the darn things in half. Uh, and you can sell those uh, to your tasting room people. You can get up to 
30, 40 bucks uh, for a, a saw in half barrel. Uh, someone who takes it home, take it home and use it as a planter, or you can use them around the winery. Uh, of course, you could just use whole barrels uh, for tasting room decoration or as little displays or tables uh, uh, in your tasting rooms. Uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of companies are out there making wine related items and furniture uh, out of used barrels. If you go onto Google Images and type in wine barrel furniture, thousands and thousands of images will come up. Uh, so if you have a local woodworker, cabinet maker, carpenter, uh, you and you've got a number of used barrels, maybe you want to uh, work with them to have them uh, build some. Uh, uh, it's easy to you, you take a stave and you, you drill a few holes in it. Hey, you got a you got a candle holder, and again, you could sell those. <laughs> Uh, for more than you'd imagine uh, in your tasting room. And there's a whole lot of candle holders to be made out of one barrel. So these are just a few ideas. Uh, sorry if I sound a little facetious. Um, uh, but a, a creative mind uh, certainly can get some money out of these old barrels. Uh, there are companies, Barrel Broker is just one of them, uh, that will come out and pay you uh, to take your old barrels away. They won't pay you much, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, But if you got a truckload, it can add up. So let's get into the meat of barrels, how to use them, how to store them, all this sort of stuff. Now on the right slide there, you've got what's called pyramid stacking, which I admit looks really cool, uh, but it takes a lot of work. And uh, you, you lay the barrels out empty, and then you fill them in place. Now you got to put the little chocks on them to keep them rolling, and then you got to lift the barrels onto that second layer, chalk them in, uh, fill those barrels, and then lift empty barrels on top. Uh, it's a lot of extra work, uh, but yeah, it looks really cool. And occasionally you'll still see wineries uh, in the old world and even in California that still do this. Uh, it's Before I would do it, uh, I'd want to do a little bit more research on it. And the chocks are a sort of a specialized shape. They're sort of an offset a prism shape, if you will. Uh, there are uh, companies in California that will make these chocks and sell them to you. Uh, you don't want to just use uh, triangles of two by four. The other problem with pyramid stacking is what if that one barrel in the middle there goes bad? Oh my God, now you got to empty all the barrels on top of it to get to it uh, and then put it all back together. So that's all I'm going to say about pyramid stacking. In the last 20 years, the biggest revolution in using barrels, of course, are the use of barrel racks. And 99% of the wineries in the world are now using these metal uh, powder-coated barrel racks. And they're what I recommend uh, that you use. Before we get into the use of racks, I just want to draw your attention to the two classic uh, shapes or forms of wine barrels. Um, uh, there are other shapes and sizes. The, the, the Hungarians uh, make some barrels that are exactly as wide as they are long. Uh, but anyway, the classic uh, two styles of French oak are the Bordeaux style on the left, the Burgundy style on the right. Uh, the Bordeaux style is longer and narrower in body. Uh, the Burgundy is wider uh, and shorter. Uh, I spent a lot of years thinking about why these traditional shapes are the way they are. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody about it. I came up with my own theory, and I'd like someone to prove me wrong or right. Uh, Burgundy, made from Pinot Noir, uh, tends to have higher solids in it than Cabernet and Merlot. And so if you have a deeper bilge, uh, it will accommodate more lees, more solids, uh, than the other shape. That's just my theory. Anyway, you've got these two shapes of barrels. You need to be aware of it because when you get on to using racks, uh, you want to keep your shapes consistent on the racks. So a list here of basic barrel uh, and rack use and safety. Uh, don't use broken or corroded or bent or cracked or otherwise unsafe racks. Uh, barrels need to be placed on these racks should be of the same type and shape, i.e. both burgundy shape or both Bordeaux shape. Uh, if you're going to put one of each on a rack, then don't use that rack for stacking because the rack will then tilt. Uh, but if you've got one of each on a rack, it's okay to mark it uh, well and put it on the top of a stack. Uh, that way it won't cause any tilting or anything. 
but again, I like to use a lot of chalk. Uh, I get what's called a box of railroad chalk. And these are uh, long four inch by one inch uh, uh, diameter hunks of chalk, uh, which you can buy by the box. Uh, and you use them for the next 20 years uh, to mark your barrels. Chalk is great to use on barrels because it washes right off. Uh, it's inexpensive, uh, can be reapplied easily, and also it's traditional. Uh, if you go to big barrel sellers out in California, you'll see most of the barrels are marked with chalk. And they have this interesting system of codes and symbols, uh, sort of like those old hobo codes. Um, barrels need to be placed on the rack uh, evenly with equal amounts uh, sticking out from the end of the rack. And when you stack them, again, the, take the time to stack them uh, in a balanced fashion. Even if you have to get off of the forklift and physically look with your eyes to make sure that your stacks uh, are even, it's very important. Um, if you're going to be lifting barrels, uh, you're, you're, you don't have a forklift and you're going to put two barrels on a rack and then a rack on top and then two more barrels on top. Uh, I'd, I'd get two people to do that uh, and not try to do it yourself. Uh, an empty barrel is about 100 to 125 pounds. Uh, I've done it, but it's not safe lifting to do that. I recommend you get some help. And if you're going to be using a forklift at all, I sure hope you've got uh, people using the forklift certified every three years. Uh, believe me, if you ever have an accident and your operators are not certified, uh, that's the first thing OSHA is going to come after, and you don't need that hassle. So if you're using forklifts, make sure you get certified every every three years. And uh, on the left, you have a barrel rack. Uh, if you're just using a pallet jack, uh, you can enter the rack from the two sides. That is to say, from the, the open side on the right or on the far left, you can bring a pallet jack under those double bars. Uh, if you're going to use a forklift or, or a lift truck, uh, you'll want to come in from the left side through the two uh, openings there, the two rectangular openings, uh, and make sure you get the forks all the way through uh, so that you have four points of contact uh, between the rack and the forks. Uh, I mentioned uh, if you're going to, uh, you can see in this picture here that says wrong, if you're going to put a single barrel uh, on a, uh, a single rack, uh, don't do it like this. Uh, I'm sure you can see that if you come over to the right side of that rack and take your hand and just lift it a little bit, that barrel is going to fall right off onto the left. Uh, the right way to put a single barrel on a rack is here. Uh, in this picture, there's actually some custom uh, chocks, uh, single barrel chocks they're called. I know that uh, uh, some rack manufacturers, Topco sells them. I know Brick Packaging sells them. Uh, check out with your barrel company. Uh, you can get these chocks. They're not absolutely necessary. I have put single barrels just on the gap there uh, of the rack uh, and maybe taken a little hunk of wood, just shoved it in there to keep the barrel from moving back and forth. Uh, and that seemed to work okay. I'm not saying, I'm not guaranteeing that that's okay. It's worked for me in the past. Uh, but in the last few years when I've been using barrels, if I use a single barrel on a rack, I use these chocks. It's just safer and better. All right. Now, uh, storing, uh, moving and stacking barrels. Uh, again, if you're just going to, if you have a small cellar and you're just using a pallet jack, uh, you can uh, 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 move with a standard 5,500 uh, 5, pound capacity pallet jack. Uh, you can easily easily move four, for, four full barrels uh, on two racks with that pallet jack. It's not easy. It takes a little strength, but it can be done. Uh, do be careful in making sharp turns. I would avoid making 90 degree snap turns uh, with a pallet jack. Uh, if you look at the way a pallet jack is designed, uh, normally you're rolling on four wheels, but those driving wheels are very close together. And if you snap that 90 degrees, you now only have three points in contact with the floor. Uh, so make your turns uh, slowly. Uh, don't do those 90 degree sharp turns. Uh, and again, if you're placing barrels on a second level, uh, use proper lifting techniques. It's best to have two people. Uh, if you are using a forklift, you can uh, lift safely with standard 4,500 pound capacity lift. 
uh, what I call a six pack, six barrels on three racks. Uh, keep in mind that just two barrels full on a rack is about 1,250 pounds. Um, and the most you want to do, the most I've ever seen, the, the sort of maximum standard in California uh, is placing a six pack on top of a six pack. As this photo here will show, you can see those stacks on the right are 12 barrels. In this case, the forklift has taken a six pack and stacked it on top of a six pack. This is not to be taken lightly. Uh, only a, <laughs> a very experienced uh, forklift operator should be doing this. If you're doing it for the first time, please do not be in a hurry. You would be surprised how easy it is for an accident to happen. And I can assure you the last thing you ever want to see in your cellar is this. Uh, and I know a little bit about this. I've, <clears throat> I've had an accident myself and knocked a few barrels over. And uh, uh, besides the alarm and the amount of shame, um, you, it takes a few while, a few minutes to, to get over it, uh, change your shorts and all the rest of that. I'm sure you can all imagine. Uh, don't let this happen to you. Uh, get, if anything, if you're new to this, practice with empty barrels for a while. Um, this can happen uh, and happens more often than you might care to know. All right. Uh, let's get into one of the most challenging aspect, aspects of barrel use. It's not easy to clean wood. Uh, the insides of barrels, the insides of staves are not sanded and finished or varnished or something. It's raw wood. And there's a lot of pores and little gaps and such. So when we're talking about cleaning and sanitizing barrels, keep in mind that uh, it's virtually impossible to sanitize a barrel 100%. Uh, but you do have some options uh, depending on the equipment and uh, the money you've got to buy uh, specialized equipment. And again, in just a minute, I'll show you some pictures of these different balls. Uh, but having a ball washer, whether it's a stationary ball uh, that can blast water in 360 degrees or whether you have a spinning uh, ball uh, that will blast jets of water uh, in 360 degrees, uh, those are invaluable for uh, washing and rinsing uh, the inside of a barrel through the bung hole. Um, so you whip your empty barrel uh, bung hole down and you stick a ball in there uh, and turn on the hot water and rinse, i.e. wash that barrel out uh, until all of the leaves, until all the red color uh, or until all the leaves has, has flowed out. You just got clear uh, water coming out. That'll take two or three or four minutes depending on, on the barrel. Uh, some people like to rinse out the leaves and then whip the barrel over with the bunghole up and then sort of clean the inside of the barrel with a pressure washer. And that's a fine idea, but keep in mind uh, that a 3,000 PSI pressure washer, uh, if you get that tip uh, close within an inch or two or three of the wood, it's going to gouge right into that. So if you're going to use a pressure washer, keep that tip uh, at least a foot away and keep that tip moving uh, inside the barrel. Uh, and that will, uh, uh, pressure washer will knock off some of the tartrates and stuck on leaves and such. And then you can run the barrel over again and re-rinse it with that, that uh, ball washer. My favorite method these days is a steam generator. Uh, this is a machine. It's like a mini boiler on wheels. It uses very little water. Uh, and it can generate uh, 40 PSI or 80 PSI steam. And you get a wand uh, that's basically a piece of pipe with a bunch of holes in it. And you stick this inside the barrel and you steam the inside of the barrel. You blast the inside of the barrel with steam. Boy, that'll really melt tartrates. It'll really open up the pores of the wood. Uh, I know one company that makes these steam generators. They took what was supposedly a cleaned barrel uh, that was dry. They weighed it. And then they steam cleaned it for five minutes and rinsed it out and let it dry again and reweighed the barrel. And it was like two or three pounds uh, lighter. Uh, the steam was able to open up the pores inside the wood and really get all that crud out of there. So uh, steam generators, as I say, they're expensive. Uh, they usually, uh, you got to have high power, three phase power. Uh, and they do use a lot of electricity, but they don't use so much water. Uh, so it's a trade off. 
Uh, but if you can afford it, uh, steam generator is really the, the best way to keep barrels clean and sanitized. Uh, some people just use the hot water method and then do a rinse with ozone. Uh, that works pretty well. Uh, keep in mind, ozone does have a little health hazard to it. I don't like to do it indoors. If I'm going to do an, uh, an ozone sanitizing, I like to do it outdoors or at least in an area that's got really good ventilation. Uh, and if you're using ozone, uh, keep in mind, you've got to wait some time for that ozone to dissipate uh, before you fill the barrel. Um, if you've cleaned out the barrel uh, or if your barrels have somehow gotten infected with Britannomyces or other really bad uh, spoilage bacterias, you can use perioxyacetic acid uh, soak uh, on barrels. I don't like perioxyacetic acid. It is it's a very aggressive oxidizer. You've absolutely got to use personal protective equipment. You've got to use rubber gloves, a face shield, uh, a, a rubber uh, apron. Uh, you get a drop of pure peroxyacetic acid on a piece of paper, it'll start burning. That's how aggressive of an oxidizer it is. But boy, it really works. And uh, if you if you know uh, the health and use hazards and you use proper protective gear, uh, a overnight soak with a light concentration of peroxyacetic acid uh, certainly will sanitize, well sanitize the inside of the barrel. Uh, but you'll have to follow that with a, a water rinse and then a quick citric acid rinse uh, and then a, another, another following water rinse. Um, I love to use uh, sodium percarbonate. For those of you who aren't aware, sodium percarbonate is just a pure, pure uh, main ingredient in OxyClean. It's basically uh, powdered hydrogen peroxide. It's wonderful. Uh, you can get it cheaply uh, in a pure form on Amazon. Uh, and I use it to soak the inside of a barrel. Uh, it will also help remove tartrates and help loosen up uh, uh, stuck on leaves and such. Uh, 24 to 72 hour soak uh, in percarbonate. Uh, then follow that with a hot water rinse, a citric acid rinse, and then another water rinse. Uh, sodium percarbonate does a wonderful job, and it's really easy on septic systems, and you don't need any, any protective equipment. It's uh, really safe to use. And then uh, if you really got some bad barrels uh, that you, you think may be on the lot, last legs, but you want to give them one more try, uh, you can try the so-called pickling, uh, where you use about three pounds of tartaric, not citric. It gets the pH down to about 2.2 and about a half a pound of uh, potassium metabisulfite, which gives you about a 50 part per million solution. Uh, you fill the barrel halfway with hot water, throw in your tartaric and your sulfur. Uh, be careful, it's gonna smell very strongly. Uh, finish up filling that barrel, stir it in really well, bung it up, uh, and let that barrel pickle for five or 10 days, and then empty it out, give it a good water rinse, uh, and then smell it and see if it smells any better. Uh, up to you whether you're gonna keep using it or not. Um, I would find when we would do a dozen barrels, there was still maybe a barrel or two out of a dozen that we just felt didn't clean up enough and we'd end up getting rid of those. But it's sort of a last resort for cleaning a barrel, um, a well-used barrel. So uh, here, as, as promised, on the left is about $150, $200 uh, spinning uh, blast uh, ball. Uh, it's got a nice little ball bearing uh, unit in there. And you can get them a little cheaper from GW Kent. Uh, you get a really high quality one uh, from Carlson and Associates. Uh, the arm in the middle, that washing arm, is also a Carlson and Associates uh, a barrel arm. It's got that little foot on it, uh, which is the exact right dimension for putting that ball inside of a barrel that's on a rack. And it's got a ball valve on the end uh, that you can put your water hose on. Very handy. Uh, if you're a little lower budget, uh, this uh, 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 non spinning, the static, uh, uh, water blasting ball you can get from GW Kent for about 40 bucks. Uh, you can simply go to the hardware store and get some PVC pipe and make your own little barrel arm, uh, a washing arm uh, to use uh, with that ball. Um, in the old days, we used to use compressed sulfur dioxide gas uh, to uh, uh, sanitize, to, to, to uh, put inside of a, of a washed or rinsed barrel. Uh, but then uh, the feds figured out that uh, that sulfur is actually cleaning fruit flies and therefore compressed sulfur is a 
pesticide. And therefore, if you want to use compressed sulfur dioxide gas, you must have a pesticide lactating license. Um, and if you're a big winery with thousands of barrels, you may want to have somebody on staff or have a vineyard person who's got a pesticide license uh, to keep using compressed sulfur gas when you gas your barrels. Uh, but in lieu of that, uh, to replace that, uh, you can buy these little sulfur discs, these five gram sulfur discs and this little sulfur burner. Uh, they're easy to use. You put a single disc. Uh, you, if you see the sulfur burning, you raise that little cage. You put a disc on the pin there. You take a lighter and you light the disc. You slip that little cage back over it. Uh, and you put this inside of a washed, rinsed barrel. Uh, and that will provide sulfur dioxide gas inside the barrel. It takes about five minutes to burn that, that little disc. And the reason you have that little cage on it is the sulfur discs want to spit out little pieces of sulfur. And you don't want those little pieces of sulfur to get inside your barrel. Um, uh, and you can get these uh, from more wine. I think you can get them from Presque Isle wine as well. Um, and get two of them or four of them uh, so you can do more than one barrel at a time. They're only about 20 or 30 bucks for the burner. And the discs themselves are a few cents a piece. Um, when you are storing empty barrels, uh, it's very important to do a monthly rehydration and gassing. Uh, take your empty cleaned barrel and uh, if it's been sitting there empty for a month, uh, put it back uh, on the floor with the bung down and give it three to five minutes of hot water. Uh, this will well, this will rehydrate uh, the barrel to keep it moist, to keep the wood sealed up. Uh, let it drip dry uh, for an hour or two at least uh, before rolling the barrel back up and burning a little sulfur disc. Uh, I know it seems silly to make a big point about using a, a pleated paper cup, but I have not found anything that's better to use uh, in the barrel storage. You do not want to put a hard bung or a silicone bung uh, in that barrel because it'll be the environment inside the barrel will be more moist, more humid than the barrel than the air on the outside, uh, and you will open the barrel after a month and find green mold inside. Uh, you can buy single sleeves of these three and a half ounce solo pleated paper cups on Amazon for about three bucks. Uh, believe me, that's the way to go. Uh, the, the pleated cup keeps uh, bugs, flies, and crap from getting inside the barrel, but it allows the moisture inside and outside the barrel to equalize. Whoops, excuse me. Um, barrel leaks, barrel repair. As I mentioned, that crows. That gap between the stoves and the headwood is the place you're more likely to see a leak. And you can call your oak salesperson and request some spiles. Those little wood cones on the left are spiles. Uh, they also make little wood wedges. They should, for every barrel you buy, they ought to send you a hand, handful of those free. But if they don't, they may charge you a few bucks for a little bag of spiles. The basic idea, and there are videos of this on YouTube, uh, but the basic idea is if you look, if you found a little leak in the crows, uh, you take a awl and you hammer it in there and you expand the hole a little bit, uh, and then insert one of these files, tap it in with a hammer, uh, and uh, the after a few hours, as that moisture uh, will make the spile expand and it'll plug that leak. Um, if you've got any real specific questions about barrel repair, barrel tools and such, uh, you can call me or email me. Um, some companies uh, are really glad to share, share knowledge on barrel repair. Um, Brick Packaging is excellent about uh, uh, explaining and providing uh, supplies for uh, uh, barrel repair. Um, barrel topping and maintenance, uh, I refer to this as the Gallo Protocol. Um, you can do whatever you want and you can top your barrels whenever you like as seldom or as often as you like. Uh, this is really the optimum professional method. Um, as we know, barrel, uh, will, wine will evaporate out of the barrel. Uh, I don't like to top barrels that are all stacked up. They leak on each other and such. So I will take my stacks all apart, lay them out on the cellar floor. I will look at the barrels to see if there's any leaking or mold issues. I'll make sure that the bung is tightly uh, placed in the bung hole. Uh, then I'll take a, a hot water and spray nozzle and I will rinse all of the dust and dirt and dead bugs and such off of the barrel. 
Uh, I'll then take a solution of tartaric acid and water and a little scrub brush, and I will scrub just, just in the area around the bung. Intuitively, as you should imagine, that where the bung goes into the bung hole, that little gap there, that's the most likely place for bacteria to start growing. And if you just take your bung, if you just take the bung right out of the barrel, any bacteria or mold that's in that gap may fall into the barrel. So this is why it's a good idea to rinse and scrub around the bung uh, and then rinse it off with water before you remove the bung. So now you've removed the bung. Well, before you do anything else, use your eyes. Look at the surface. Is it a nice clean surface or do you have a surface yeast forming or do you have stuff floating? Uh, you can do a lot uh, determining the, the condition of the wine in a barrel just with your eyes. And before you grab your wine thief and grab a sample out of the barrel, just put your nose right up to the bunghole and smell the headspace. Believe me, there's a lot of information about the condition of the wine that can be gotten just from that little bit of air uh, in the barrel headspace. Uh, predominantly, the first thing you'll smell is uh, volatile acidity uh, or any spoilage bacteria. You'll smell that in that headspace. Anyway, once you've done that, uh, then do take a sample of your wine, check your free sulfur. Uh, if it's a, if it's a, if there's an issue with the barrel, you may have to send out a sample uh, to get it plated for Britannomyces or any other bacterias. Uh, but anyway, if it's a clean barrel uh, and if you just need to add a little sulfur uh, uh, to it, uh, I recommend stirring the additions into the barrel. I don't like to just pour sulfur solution in and then wine and top it. I like to stir that addition in. Um, if you've got a large lot of barrels, you've got a dozen barrels of Tempranillo, and gosh, Drew, I really don't want to have to check every individual barrel. Perfectly acceptable to just uh, take a sample from three or four of those barrels and consider that a composite barrel sampling uh, to do your testing on. Um, uh, then once you've done all that, just top it up with clean wine uh, right to the top of the bung hole and insert a clean and sanitized bung. Uh, of course, a little bit of wine will then leak out, and you want to rinse that barrel once, once again with hot water, uh, stack them all up, and put them away. There are easier ways to top barrels, and I suggest uh, that you don't cut any corners and you use uh, this protocol. All right, uh, one or two or three more slides, and we'll get to Q&A. I am not going to give a lecture on oxidative versus reductive uh, aging of wine. If you're aware of it, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know, uh, reach out to Dr. Bodhisattu about the difference between oxidative and reductive environments. Uh, but in simple terms, uh, when a wine has sat in a, an oxygen-free environment for a long time, uh, it can become reduced. Those fresh, fruity aromas can sort of convert to canned or cooked fruit aromas. Uh, you can even start to notice a little hydrogen sulfide aroma uh, in a, a barrel of wine that is getting reduced. And at that point, all the barrel needs is a little air. And so classically uh, in the West Coast, on the West Coast, uh, uh, we'll do what's called a rack and return. And this is just taking the wine out of the barrel, uh, cleaning the inside of the barrel, checking uh, the, the lot of wine in the tank uh, before returning it uh, to barrels. Uh, so get all your barrels together at the same lot, sample and taste them to make sure they're, they're all good and they don't have any faults. Uh, all of the good barrels can get racked together into a tank. Uh, the other handy thing is that now you've homogenized this, this lot of 12 barrels. Uh, now you know what the whole lot smells. Every barrel individually is going to taste and smell different. But now that you've put them all back into a tank, you've hom homogenized the lot. And uh, it makes it easier to uh, uh, check the uh, free sulfur there and make that adjustment before you return the lot to, a, to uh, barrels. Uh, the other thing is it gives you a time to check your, your, your barrel uh, aroma and flavor uh, mix. Uh, now that you've got this homogenized lot, you may decide, you know, there's not enough new oak in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two of those old barrels out of the lot and bring in now two new uh, barrels to, to pump up the oak. Uh, or likewise, you decided, hmm, I've got plenty of oak flavor here. Uh, I'm going to take those three new barrels out and replace them with some neutral barrels. So a rapid return not only is good for wine, uh, gets a little air into the wine when it needs it, uh, but it can allow you to adjust your barrel blend uh, during the maturation. Um, 
um, I think one or two more slides and we're out of here. Yeah, I'm here at the end. Uh, that's all I was going to talk about. I'd just like to acknowledge all of my coworkers here, all the grad students and student interns at the Greek Reading and Technology Project. Uh, and thank you all for your attention. Uh, there is my email address. I do respond to my emails. And uh, uh, if you email me with something that seems uh, like we'd be better talking about it on phone, I'll give you my phone number and we can talk about it on the phone. Uh, I love to share my knowledge. Um, I, uh, uh, I don't have a degree in enology or in science, uh, but I have a whole lot of experience that I bring to the table. And I hope you've enjoyed this practical presentation. Thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. Actually, I was wondering if you uh, still wanted to say a few words about bungs. Ah, yes. Thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. Most of the new barrels you buy come with these little wooden bungs. Those are actually just temporary shipping bungs, uh, not really for use uh, uh, with wine. Uh, in the old country, they still use some wooden uh, bungs, but I don't recommend them because they're hard to keep clean and sanitized. Uh, the best bungs these days are made out of uh, hard silicon rubber, and there's two basic designs. There's the solid bung, uh, which you, you, you use when the wine uh, is 100% finished with fermentation, uh, finished with malolactic fermentation, and you really want to get a hermetic seal uh, on that barrel. Uh, there are other bungs called fermentation bungs, and these are of various design, and they allow you to, to either finish up fermentation or to allow the finishing of malolactic fermentation in barrel. Uh, keep in mind that malolactic fermentation does produce CO2 gas, and so these fermentation bungs have a little one-way check valve uh, that allow CO2 to escape from the barrel, but no oxygen or fruit flies uh, to get in the uh, uh, into the bung hole. Uh, so uh, uh, silicon bungs are what I, I recommend. Uh, and as I say, once your wine is through fermenting, uh, primary and secondary, you don't want to use a fermentation bung anymore. You'll want to change over to a solid uh, bung. Uh, and bungs can be cleaned the exact same way as any other equipment uh, and sanitized with a standard sanitizer. Thank you. So now if we have um, any questions, you're welcome to type them either in the chat box or the Q&A um, box there, and um, we'll try to answer them. Will we be sharing a copy of the presentation? Well, yes, the presentation uh, has been recorded. The recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. I also have the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I assume, um, Mr. Horton, that it's okay to send the presentation to the participants here. Um, is that okay? Yes, it is. I, uh, if you're going to post it, I prefer it be posted as a PDF. Yes. Uh, but yes, I, I have no objection to, to sending it out, people using it. Thank you. Do you lose a lot by using oak chips instead? I understand that you lose in marketing and sexiness, but do you lose lots of quality? Yeah, that's a really, really super good question, and I want to make this absolutely clear. You cannot duplicate what happens in a wine, a wooden wine barrel using wood chips or cubes or balls or staves in a tank. Keep in mind that barrels are not just about flavor and aroma. The slow micro oxidative process that can only occur in a barrel uh, cannot really be replicated in a tank. Okay, some people have developed these little micro ox units that try to mimic barrel micro oxidation by adding pure oxygen at a very slow rate into a tank. And, you know, uh, sure, I guess if you really work with it a lot, you could have a micro oxygen unit and oak adjuncts, and you would closely uh, do what's going on in a barrel. Uh, but I could just tell you, it is not the same. Uh, actually, the, the micro oxidative uh, 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 chemistry that occurs inside of a barrel, a wooden barrel, uh, is very, very complex. And uh, adding chips or whatever to a wood, uh, to a wood chips or whatever to a wine, 
uh, it's only going to add flavor and aroma. It is not going to give the benefits of extended lees contact and microoxidation. Thank you. There is a question about the cost of new barrels. Uh, the cost of barrels is going up, no question about it. Um, and the demand for barrels is going up. Uh, you're all probably aware that uh, the bourbon and whiskey making industry is having a rapid explosion right now. And uh, with whiskey barrels, they to be called whiskey, it's got to be put in 100% new oak. Uh, so the barrel companies are getting a lot of new customers. Um, the short answer is that a American oak barrels uh, you can get for about $350 to $550. And French oak is going to be $850 to over $1,200 $1, a barrel. Um, so you can do the math. There's 300 bottles in a barrel. And if you've got a $600 American oak barrel, well, $2 a bottle is your oak cost. But if you use that barrel over five years, you age five vintages of wine in that barrel. Now you're down to, uh, what is that, 30 cents per bottle. Or, uh, you get my point. Uh, you can amortize the cost of the barrel over various vintages. But somewhere around 500 for an American oak and somewhere well over 1200 bucks for a French oak barrel. Uh, Hungarian oak barrels are somewhere in the middle there. Um, there's a follow-up question to the uh, chips um, one. What about chips or blocks used in a neutral barrel? Ah, very good question. Certainly, uh, that's a great idea. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you've got a neutral barrel uh, that is clean and well-maintained, uh, that is no longer able to give flavor uh, and uh, aromas to, uh, certainly you could use some oak adjuncts or some uh, uh, staves. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different designs of these oak products, but uh, using them in a, uh, in a wood barrel certainly will mimic what a, what a new barrel would do. It's a good way to save money. Uh, keep in mind, though, that you're displacing some of the wine. Uh, uh, so when you're doing inventory, uh, you no longer have 225 liters in that barrel. If you've added oak chips to it, you've got a few liters less because it's being taken up by those uh, those chunks or cubes or, or, or uh, whatever. We have a comment as well, rather than a question. I would argue that evaporation is actually a pro and not a con. The concentration effect of small atomic mass, un mass unit molecules transiting the pores and the big ones staying, staying, staying put inside. I would agree. I would agree 100% with that comment. Um, uh, this person obviously has a uh, has some knowledge of chemistry and how wood works. Um, certainly, that evaporation does uh, concentrate uh, the flavor and aroma compounds uh, in a wine, adding to the character and complexity of a wine. No doubt about it. Uh, I was only presenting it from a uh, a businessman's point of view. Uh, that, hey, we're losing 6% of our product a year by using those damn barrels. So, uh, yeah, let's agree there's a, there's a pro and a con uh, to, to using barrels. And I would agree with you that the, uh, the con uh, overweighs uh, uh, the pro. Uh, the pro overweighs the con. Mm -hmm. um, what is your opinion of wood source? Virginia versus Missouri versus Minnesota. I assume this refers to American barrels. Yes, this does, reserve, uh, this does refer to American oak. Uh, yeah, you've got uh, Missouri, uh, you've got Minnesota, of course. Uh, I've seen barrels that say Appalachia, and I'm assuming that's either parts of Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, that sort of thing. Uh, Missouri, uh, Missouri oak uh, is well known as well. Um, they are all uh, slightly different. Um, just like in France, where they've been managing forests uh, for hundreds of years, uh, the oak from the forest of Allier uh, smells and tastes different from the forest of Vosges, uh, which is different from the oak uh, found in the forest of Limousin. Certainly, just like with grapes, the soil that the trees are growing in will affect, affect the, the flavor, aroma, character of a given wood. Um, uh, uh, I can say that uh, I, I, I'm in Minnesota. I sure like Minnesota oak. 
one of the things I like about Minnesota oak is we're a very cold climate up here. The oak trees grow slower and tend to have tighter grain uh, than oak trees uh, grown 500 miles to the south. Um, but I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, my advice is to get out there and smell as many barrels as you can. Uh, go to barrel adjunct uh, distributors and say, hey, can you send me a sample of American oak chips from Missouri versus Minnesota versus whatever, uh, or do some online research. There certainly are flavor and aroma uh, differences uh, depending on where the oak tree is grown, the soil where it's grown, the climate where it's grown, uh, whether the oak was kiln aged or whether it was air dried, uh, the toast level of that oak. All of these come into play uh, and add variables to your question. Um, what do you think about hybrid barrels, French American? Those are my favorite barrels. I love hybrid barrels. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a hybrid barrel, uh, the, 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 the few that I've seen uh, from uh, either Radu or, or Seguin Moreau, uh, they are Minnesota oak staves uh, for the body of the barrel and then French oak headwood. Uh, I think the head represents something like 33% of the surface area uh, and I love those hybrid barrels I think you're, you're saving some money uh, but you're getting the best of both worlds you're getting some of that uh, American quality as well as some of the French quality as well I love using hybrid barrels on Marquette but again I don't I suppose there's not a lot of Marquette down in Texas um, do you have any experience with hybrid barrels um, oak and uh, other species other, than other species of wood. Yeah. The only other species of wood uh, that I'm aware of uh, for wine is acacia wood. Uh, yeah, the vinegar makers have chestnut wood, ash wood, juniper wood, all sorts of neat aromatic woods. But uh, basically, winemakers use either oak uh, or or acacia. Um, acacia is generally used for white wines. Uh, I'm actually going to get a miniature acacia wood barrel this season to use. Um, all I can really say is that they're different. Uh, the different types of woods, French or American, uh, they have different types of tannins and different flavors and aromas. Um, you know, it's just one of those things you're going to have to experiment with. I can assure you that every winemaker that I've worked for in over 20 years never ever uses the same type of barrels. They're always bringing in new barrels every year from a new area or from a new maker. There's constant experimentation going on. Uh, certainly uh, wineries may, uh, winemakers may have their favorite barrel, but you'll hardly ever see a winery where it's 100% of those barrels. There is always uh, room for, uh, for variation and such. All right. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions? at this point. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Horton, again for this um, excellent presentation. We, thank uh, you for the opportunity, Dr. Bodazatu. It was a pleasure. Um, uh, thank you all for being here today. And please um, take one minute of your time to fill out the survey at the end of this event. Thank you again, all, and um, I will see you next time. Have a good day. Have a happy harvest, people. Stay happy safe. Happy harvest. Out there. Yeah. <laughs>